You think there are only two living species of elephants, don't you? The African elephant and the Asian elephant, right? Wrong. Yeah. Maybe they only thought of one. We're often excluded. The taxonomic story of the elephants begins in Sweden with this man, the Swedish zoologist Carl Linnaeus. By analyzing and describing tons of animals and plants, he laid the foundations of modern taxonomy. And among several creatures he studied, we find an elephant. The fetus of an elephant, to be precise. It had been bought by the king of Sweden to enlarge Linnaeus' collection. Linnaeus grouped animals in six taxonomic classes mammals, birds, amphibians, fish, insects and verns, which he described as animals of slow motion, soft substance, able to increase their bulk and restore parts which have been destroyed, extremely tenacious of life, and the inhabitants of moist places. Basically, slug-like creatures. When it comes to mammals, he based his classification system on teeth. With that in mind, he created the order Bruta, which groups animals that lack four teeth but have tusks. Bruta also groups animals that have feet with strong hoof-like nails, move slowly and eat mostly vegetables. Mm, herbivore animals. Here's where he placed the elephants together with animals such as manatees, pangolins and giant anteaters. Linnaeus had invented the binomial system in which all living beings were named using what's called scientific names, consisting of two words, genus and species. More than that, here. Elephants didn't sound very scientific, so he had to come up with a more formal name, with Latin or Greek roots, and he did so. Hmm, what about Megalotherium? It sounds original and scientific, right? Hmm, hmm. maybe. I don't know. Aha! Uh -huh. Trunchium giganteum. Hmm. Nah. The scientific name of the elephants, huh? Oh, yes! Elephus! Elephus Maximus! Elephus Maximus became, then, the scientific name of the elephants. So much so that to this day, it's still the scientific name of the Asian elephant. But Linnaeus didn't notice that his fetus came from an African elephant. Also, little did he know that Asian and African elephants weren't the same. Around 20 years later, this guy walks into the conversation. He's a German physician, naturalist, physiologist and anthropologist named Johann Friedrich Blumenbach. Clearly German. He's mainly known for his work on human races, but he also had a burning passion for studying animals. So much so, that he read and studied Linnaeus work, and decided to do his own classification system using several of the technical terms introduced by the Swedish scientist. Trying to improve Linnaeus' system, in 1797, he published his this, better known as the Handbook of Natural History. And in this book, he agrees with Linnaeus and sticks to the elephant's genera, but he changes the species and adds a second species, based on the geographical location of the elephants. In other words, he changes Maximus for Asiaticus and adds another species, Elephus africanus. This is the first scientific description of African elephants, where Blumenbach pointed out the differences between African and Asian elephants, the most striking ones being the shape of the head the Asian elephants having notably smaller ears and the African elephants being a bit taller than their Asian cousins. So, according to Linnaeus, there's one species of elephants within the family Bruta, Elephus maximus. Blumenbach added a second species, the African elephant, and changed the species name. More than half a century after Linnaeus published his work in England, this man appears on the scene. He's John Edward Gray, a British zoologist who works at the Keeper of Zoology of the British Museum. In 1821, he publishes this book, which could have been easily named like this, though it lacks the scientific and British style of the original title. 
In this book, he gets rid of Linnaeus Bruta and places Ayafas with this one, which comes from the Greek word used for trunk. Describe the sword like this. Mm, basically, big things, big skin, toes with hooves, trunk, and tusks. This is what the taxonomic status of the elephants looks so far, but the story goes on. Now, let me introduce you to Frederick Cuvier. He had a very famous zoologist brother, George Cuvier. He followed his brother's steps and became a zoologist himself, working as the head keeper of the animal collection at the French Natural History Museum. When it comes to the elephant case, he made a huge contribution. We can find it in the book Natural History of Mammals, that he published in 1825 with this guy, a zoology professor, whose name I will not even try to pronounce. In the chapter titled The Elephants of Africa, which by the way, if you haven't noticed yet, they nailed the titles. They state that when it comes to classifying animals, particularly mammals, the method of doing so shouldn't be arbitrary. The research done in the past have shown that each system of organs is key when it comes to putting animals together, and it's necessary to have more specific criteria when classifying species. So the fact that both elephants were placed in the same genus indicated that they were very, very closely related in taxonomic terms. However, they argue that African and Asian elephants have some clear differences, just like Blumenbach had stated before. So they had to come up with a name and change the genus of the African elephant. What do we do? A scientific name, huh? Elephants are so majestic, we've got tons of options, right? Yep, they're huge for instance. They also got that impressive trunk. Or that weird pair of to- Wait, I've got it. Tell me, the teeth. Let's call them Loxodonta because of the enamel on their molars. Are you serious? I love it. And the new name was Loxodonta Africana, which an anonymous author turned into Loxodonta. So it sounded more Latin. Here's our situation then. Two species of elephant in two different genera, both under the same order. This is the current situation of the elephants, right? Well, nope. Among the big African elephants everyone had described, there could be spotted some slightly different elephants. Time passed, and in 1900, a German zoologist named Paul Matschi, who happened to enjoy naming species, described three specimens found in Cameroon. By analyzing them, he concluded that they were different from other African elephants. So he proposed the name Loxodon Tessiclotis, and he kept naming elephant species. Seven years later, the African elephant species fever increased, and another scientist, in this case an English naturalist and geologist, even proposed a sixth based on the shape of their ears, though in this case, he classified these as subspecies. Throughout the 20th century, more species have been proposed, and the debate was set in the scientific community. How many species of African elephant existed? Were they species or subspecies? Currently, the debate seems to have been closed, and we owe that to genes. Oh, no, I mean, genes. Thanks to the progress made in the field of genetics, scientists managed to extract the DNA both of living and extinct elephants and their relatives in order to find out how different they are as species and if they are that different to begin with. And these studies have helped to build the current tree of life that represents how closely related one species is from the other. These are the results. Surprisingly, this research has shown that mastodons were the first to branch of the tree. So much so that they do not even appear in this tree as they do not belong to the taxonomic family Elephantidae. Within this family, we can see that African elephants branched off first. In other words, they are the most distantly related to Asian elephants. And, according to genetic analysis, some of the authors we've talked about were right. Having collected genetic samples from a lot of elephants throughout Africa, scientists concluded there existed two different species of African elephant. Yes, species. Well done, Mashi. Why species? Because genes showed they had split from one another a lot of time ago, enough time for them to evolve into very different animals, at least in terms of genes. Then, science recognizes two species of African elephants, the one that prefers open spaces, aka savannas, with the clever name of African bush elephant, 
and the smaller African forest elephant that fences jungles, not forests. So we've got on one side of the tree African elephants, and on the other side the Asian elephant, only represented by the genus Elephas. Well done, Carl, but with a bunch of subspecies, meaning animals that slightly differ from one another, with the genetic information so similar that they do not make up their own species. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe. Have an elephant day.